morning, everyone. Thank you for the great introduction, Gemma. My name is Netra Pan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And it's my great pleasure to be with this very esteemed panel and to kick off Hello Tomorrow. So we have a full house. This means that everyone here is absolutely interested in deep tech, what it means, what's unique about it, and what it means uh, to support deep tech, which is really different from supporting other types of startup and innovative technologies. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you Franz Nauta, Pablo Rodriguez, Marcus Larson, and Martin Bomer. Can we welcome them to the stage one more time? Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So to get us started, I actually have a question for the audience. Um, I know many of us wear many hats, but could we have a show of hands for those of you who are representing academia? Ah, oh, yes, my scientists in the house, great. <laughs> and startupers? Wow, okay, okay, great. How about um, those of you wearing a corporate hat? Nice, we are counting on you to help us accelerate this deep tech ecosystem. How about a miscellaneous? Did I forget someone? Great, I love those people. We'll hear what you're doing um, in a bit. So on my left is Franz Nauta. We're very lucky to have Franz here. Franz is a lecturer at UC Berkeley in Utrecht, and he's currently in Climate Kick, leading the largest accelerator for clean tech in the world. Uh, they have funded, they have supported over 800 startups, and these startups have gone on to raise $700 million in follow-on funding. They're present in 45 countries. He also runs the Climate Kick Startup Accelerator, which has supported 1,000 startups, and these startups have gone over to raise $600 million in follow-on funding. On his left is Pablo Rodriguez, who has spent 10 years at Telefonica. In the last six years, he's been the innovation director, and in the last three years, has been the CEO of Alpha, Europe's very own moonshot factory. And we'll hear a little bit more about exactly what that means. Um, Pablo uh, has crossed two institutions of mine. He used to be an adjunct professor at Columbia University, and he received his PhD at EPFL. He's also worked at Microsoft and in Silicon Valley. Uh, then we have Marcus Larsson. Marcus is a Swedish national. Um, he received degrees in engineering and intellectual capital management from Chalmers University. Marcus has spent the last 10 years across the ocean. <laughs> and he'll be bringing tales from 10 years uh, at Park, a Xerox company. Marcus runs the business side and will be sharing some really interesting insights on how he supports actors from the public and the private sector to implement breakthrough technologies. And then last but not least, we're very glad to have Martin Bomer, who is our French representative uh, in this panel. So Martin is from Niort in the west of France. He moved to Paris and since 2018 has been the executive director of Jeune avec Macron. So Martin actually represents the voice of the youth that helped to elect our president, Emmanuel Macron. Um, and then in his day job, he works in innovation at General Electric, but we might have a special announcement coming from Martin in a few, in a few minutes. All right, so let's start off with um, some definitions before I, I open it up to the panel. So why are we here talking about deep tech? Um, what is different from deep tech and other types of startups? So I think the key thing to remember and what we'll be working on is this panel is going to focus specifically on startups that are based on cutting edge technological and scientific progress. So with that, I'd like to turn to the panelists and I'd like you to talk about your personal relationship with deep tech how you actually developed an interest in deep tech, and what you think are the most pressing needs in terms of deep tech applications going forward. We can start with you, friends. And all of that in two minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll be cutting them off. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome, uh, not welcome, thank you for inviting us. It's, a, it's an honor to be on the panel. 
Um, so my relation with deep tech stems from my background in environmental technology. That's where I started my studies and I had a career as a civil servant developing environmental policy. And uh, one of the things I noticed is that um, the, if, if we set up good policies, the businesses would actually give it real oomph. So, th so the impact of, of sort of environmental regulations turned out to be the deepest once we had a technology that could really put behind it and then entrepreneurs scaling it. And the, the best example, of course, is a, a small company that was started in 2003 by Mark Tarpenning. And uh, who was the second one? Uh, Mark Tarpenning and... Well, the name of the company is called Tesla. So just so you know, um, Elon Musk wasn't the founder. Uh, so they started a company in 2003 in California and they completely revolutionized the whole supply chain of the car manufacturing industry. And, and because of Tesla, about, there's about 200 billion euros spent now by existing car manufacturers to go electric. Um, that's just one example. If you look at solar, if you look at wind, the, the, the regulations in Denmark, the regulations in, in Germany have led to really mature markets for wind and solar. And of course, that only happened because of good policy combined with entrepreneurs moving in that market. So, so I'm responsible for Climate Launchpad, which is a, a business idea competition. And basically, our goal is to have about 100,000 new entrepreneurs going into clean tech mm -hmm. in order to fix climate change. Okay, thank you very much for that. So, of course, w representing the need to develop deep tech applications to combat climate change. That's really, that's really great. Paolo, what are your thoughts on the most pressing deep tech applications that we need to address? Um, thank you, thank you. So, it's the 30 years since the web, 60 years since the internet, and my sense is that um, a lot of uh, the era of the low-hanging fruits is uh, it's getting to an end. And um, if we really believe that we want to have an impact beyond e-commerce and social media, um, we need to get closer to science. And I don't mean pop science, I mean uh, really uh, scientific breakthroughs. Uh, the good news is that over the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've seen a plethora of uh, uh, tech evolving in the right direction. Um, AI and ML, uh, robotics, sensors, um, quantum. Um, but at the same time, we also live in a time of uh, unprecedented uh, social challenges. Mm -hmm. We see um, the lack of access to uh, clean energy, to water, health, education, inequalities. And um, at Alpha, we are a moonshot factory, um, first one here in Europe. We are uh, putting together radical solutions, deep tech, um, big social problems um, to create uh, uh, very focused, long-term, uh, and still open-ended um, opportunities, moonshots, uh, that are going to try to tackle these problems in a very focused way and try to come up with solutions using uh, deep tech, getting it out of the lab, and putting it in the hands of uh, people to solve uh, real problems that uh, will move the needle. Thank you so much, Pablo. So we have this interesting perspective from Franz, who is working with a um, an initiative that's supported by the European Union. And then, Pavel, you're representing actually the corporate voice because Telefonica has cr allowed you to set up this moonshot factory. And you've used it specifically to try and develop moonshots that are going to address the most pressing problems that face our planet, right? So you were talking about access to energy. Um, I know mental health is a big focus for you. We might have time to go into that. Um, and you've touched on also specific deep tech applications in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, that are potentially going to enable us to have that impact on 100 million people, um, according to your moonshot definition. So, thank you. So, Marcus, now let's hear another corporate perspective. Um, sure. So, you know, from, from where we sit in, in the valley, so I represent Xerox Park, and for those of you who haven't heard of us, we, we've, uh, you know, made some pretty impactful inventions over the last few decades, personal computing, Ethernet, laser printing, so on, stuff that you probably all use kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. And we've transformed our operations, really, over the last, actually, 15, 20 years from a kind of corporate R&D center to an open innovation business, really focused on, uh, you know, deep tech innovation before 
that was a thing, and even before open innovation was a thing, to be frank, right? Mm. And where, from where I sit today, the, the sort of the most pressing challenges that, you know, we're working on, that we're, we're seeing you know, out there in the world, really are, you know, in the, in sort of broadly in the domains of climate change um, and artificial intelligence, right? So these are, you know, these are big trends or big, um, areas that we just as societies, and that includes corporate startups, academics, uh, investors, uh, governments, uh, really need to get right. In, in climate change, it's obviously already here, despite of some of what you might be hearing from across the pond. Um, and, you know, artificial intelligence is coming, right? And so we, we really, you know, purposefully invest in developing, you know, advancing the sciences and developing the technologies and then partnering with corporates, with startups, um, with governments to, you know, have those technologies transfer out in the world and then have impact. And, and you know, that's sort of our business model is making money that way. Um, and, you know, from an artificial intelligence standpoint, we really believe that the next generation or the next wave of research really has to focus on transparency and accountability. Right, so these, these systems are now being deployed widely and broadly but, and are making decisions and recommendations that are increasingly impactful for people, for you know, real people. Mm. Um, but they are incapable today of you know, justifying the recommendations or the decisions that they make. And that can be fairly mundane things, like this is a photo of a dog, not a cat. It can be relatively impactful things like, well, you should get parole and you shouldn't. And, and if we can't figure out, and there's a lot of new science that's brewing in this space, obviously, and we're, we're working together with the, you know, the ecosystem in the valley to kind of help advancing this. But if we can't figure out how to, how to you know, um, solve those types of problems, then I think we may face a situation where there's either a huge backlash against those, these types of technologies that can be very impactful and very positive right. for societies, um, and that will, you know, then result in them not being used and sort of a lot of un unrealized potential. So that's a big theme for right. us right now. Thank, thank you for actually putting that into context because, of course, climate change is a really pressing need that we need to urgently act upon. But the United Nations has actually um, set out multiple sustainable development goals, which provides another whole basket of problems slash opportunities to address. And, and then, Marcus, you've taken an even more macro view, talking about the need to implement uh, transparency um, into these technologies. So uh, normally, so I'm talking about not in this group, when you talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, you might get puzzled stares and skeptical, scared looks, right? Um, Self-driving cars are already showing a complication of that. So I think you're talking about a bit of a more macro need to render these technologies accessible, usable, and understandable um, by the public. And Xerox has a great track record in doing that, you know, from the graphical user interface um, to the early prototypes of a mouse, like, otherwise we would be talking in code still to our computers. Well, some of us still do. Uh, Martin, before I get into more programming language, what is your perspective on deep tech? First of all, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Maybe I can ask the room, who is a, a policy maker or related to policy making in the room? Okay, so that's two people. <laughs> Three actually, sorry. Three. And I think that's, that's one of the issues. So thank you very much for having me on the stage here. I'm not an elected member of any parliament yet. So um, I'm, I'm also uh, being very realistic on the, um, on, on the need of relationship we need to have between the ecosystems of innovators and, and policy makers. So as a, as a member of a, of a political organization, I think my duty is to uh, prepare my, my country and my society to, uh, to live in a better world in the future so the next generation uh, lives in a more sustainable and a better world. That's my, my mission number one. And how does this relate to deep tech? I think is our responsibility is to create the right ecosystem for you guys to innovate um, with all the tools that you need. So that means we need to deliver um, a good education. So we have trained people who are aware of the challenges of the world, who are maybe uh, able to code. And today that's going to be a challenge for all the high school and, uh, and, and education for, for, new, um, for, for new children today. 
Step number two is to give you the right uh, economic environment. You need to have the right possibility to get R&D funding, to get the right spaces, to be in the right locations. And all that is creating a, a good environment. And lastly, and I think where, this is where we have the most important work to do, especially in Europe today, is to give you access to funding, either to start your own companies, but also to scale up. And today, in the environment where we are in, especially France, um, uh, we have an issue on, on getting our companies, which are very great in innovative technologies, and make them grow, uh, because we have a different system than uh, from the US particularly. And I think there is a, a lot of work to do. So my, uh, my view on how, how we should work together is that we have a, a duty to deliver the right environment for you guys, but you have also a duty to us to help us understand what's going to happen. Or what we mentioned on, on climate change and the social challenges we have today, um, we will only solve them if we have a dialogue at some point. We can't come afterwards and regulate afterwards, which is typically leading to killing businesses. And this is not where we want to go. And I think the message of uh, Munir just before is really about that, is um, tell us what you're doing, us policymakers, but also the, uh, the general public. They need to know what you guys are working on. They need to know that your future is going to change and that they don't discover uh, massive changes, radical changes in their daily life without a little bit of um, early warning. So that's my, uh, my take on that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Martin. So I'd like to segue now into two sections. So first, I'd like to ask the panelists, what do you think you've done right? Or what do you think your institution has done right in terms of supporting deep tech, right? Because these are technologies that are based on breakthrough scientific research, which requires a lot more lead time. It requires um, human capital, um, specialized human capital. So. Um, I'd like to discuss that and then the change that you'd like to see. Um, but let's start with Marcus because actually, you know, you're a great example of someone who is highly educated in the European system and is now working in Silicon Valley, right? So this is one of the issues, I guess, that in, in uh, discussing the future of deep tech for Europe, right? So there is no doubt that Europe has the University Research Foundation, um, bright talents, um, but what do we do to actually allow the European public to benefit from these things? So I know that's a huge, pro that's a huge problem, I'm not throwing that on you, but what do you think you've done right or what have you seen in terms of regulation or initiatives that have supported deep tech? All right, so that is a big question. So two minutes, got it. All right, so, um, so I mean, you know, we can start from, from the institution itself, right? So I think what we've done right and you know, over you know, our entire history is, is really kind of our, have been our willingness that's now instantiated in our business model, right? To partner openly you know, outside of the corporate boundaries, right? And so that manifests itself in a number of different ways, right? We spin off companies, we partner with corporates. And that, I think, is really, and why that's important is that no one corporation, no one startup, no one government can do everything and solve every problem and, and, and really, you know, commercialize or bring to market every technology, right? So each capability, each problem is different and you need to, you know, allow yourself the flexibility to, to, you know, partner or, you know, set up the right type of business or the right type of business model to go after it with the technology you've developed, right? So that's sort of from the institute standpoint. What that has done, though, is that allowed us to attract a, a breed of technologists and scientists that are unusual in that they have, you know, from a kind of from day one, a very entrepreneurial bent which is something you wouldn't typically see. I know it's not you know, generally true, but you wouldn't typically see that in, in universities, for instance, that kind of have a same you know, level of technical depth that we do, but just the, the virtue of having the business model and the way that we're set up really kind of advances that. So I think that's sort of at the institute level. Now, if you look at, if you look at the ecosystem uh, in Silicon Valley and kind of more broadly in the US, I think there's a couple of things that have been done right there that are, uh, I think, something that the European community could really learn from, right? 
And you know, it's it's and some of these are fairly cliche, right? For instance, you know, celebration of or failure, at least not penalizing of failure, right? And that's very true, obviously, in the startup community in in the valley, right? Where you know, having failed once, twice, three times doesn't actually it's it's not an impediment to getting the next round of funding. It's typically more of a a um, a uh, badge of honor. Thank you. Yes, a badge of honor. Exactly. And it's sort of hand in hand with that is this sort of celebration of kind of crazy ambition, right? right. Of people who really try to do something wild and crazy and big, right. right? And to me, that is important. And then thirdly, I'll just say at the federal level, mm. um, you know, having agencies that are run by the government that also try to really advance those crazy um, ambitious ideas like DARPA or ARPA-E that put real dollars behind, you know, trying to solve very, very hard technical problems that may or may not have commercial application, but that really allows you to advance the state of science, and then those typically end up showing up in commercial enterprises. So self-driving cars is probably the most recent example of that, but there's many more if you look back historically. Yeah. And that's a, just having those type of ultra high risk tolerant, well-funded agencies right. to sponsor right. research like that, right. and then having all the intellectual property setups work in favor of commercialization downstream of that then is really important. I think right. that's something that the US government gets Thank really right. Thank you so much, Marcus. So I, I think what I hear from you mainly is this need for a mindset change. So I think that starts with each of us, and it's extremely difficult personally, I mean, for me even to implement when I make a mistake, right? But it's this idea that you make a mistake, you fail, and you learn from it, and that needs to go to the um, uh, more higher levels as well, from a governmental level. Um, Let me, because I think it's important. It's not really about making mistakes, right? It really is about, you know, you try to do something and it may not work. You may do everything exactly. right and it may still not work, right? So, so that's a, that is the mindset shift that we're talking about. Right? Absolutely. So I even made a mistake by using the word mistake. But it was for illustrative purposes. <laughs> um, so to reframe that, um, essentially, so this is what I, we tell our bachelors and master's students, you're, in your life, all you're doing are testing hypotheses, right? So you're just saying, is this a valid hypothesis? Can, can we find evidence for it or not? And that needs to go to the higher levels in terms of also giving funding or receiving protection, legal protection, when a company goes bankrupt. Um, and then I think you're also touching on something really important that I would love Pablo and Franz to comment on, which is this idea of crazy ambition, but not necessarily just for money making. I mean, I think this is, again, a very unique community. So a lot of people here have a scientific background, right? And you don't go into science to, to make a lot of money, as far as I know, right? So um, maybe you could talk about the things that you're trying, that you've seen have gone right and that you are trying to promote within your institutions. So from, um, from a corporate point of view, innovation is um, it's, it's not optional. It's something that you need to do to, uh, to keep being relevant. Um, a lot of corporations, they're really good at um, the next iteration of what's coming from 3G to 4G to 4G to 5G, the next version of uh, uh, high-speed networks, fiber in the home, um, and, and that's really hard. That requires a lot of people, that requires a lot of deep tech, right. that requires a lot of effort, and it's not trivial, you know. Uh, making sure that trains come on time every day is something very hard. It requires precise machines that don't fail. Um, if you dare yourself to understand that um, the, uh, if you, if, if you want to grab a, uh, um, what's happening in the future and you want to set yourself uh, for the opportunities that uh, may be relevant in five years, you need to put yourself 15 years away because what used to be typically Horizon 3, now with things accelerating so much, could be implemented in Horizon 5. Um, and you really think that uh, you, you want to uh, have activities that move the needle, you need to have a mind, sh um, uh, a, a mind shift change. And that requires, for us, it requires separate uh, organization altogether. Mm. We thought that if we were to implement motion thinking, 
if we needed to uh, really go after bold, um, ambitious projects that um, would be open-ended and probably beyond the core business of the current organization that we couldn't do from within the existing business units or within the, the existing R&D organization. So the first mindset change was uh, getting uh, board and CEO uh, uh, of the of the mother company to realize that this was an opportunity have a lot of discussion understanding what were the pros and the cons and and setting up a separate organization to go after these that would nurture that spirit of, of ambition and that culture to bring in new talent that would make this a reality yeah so I think that's an excellent point I mean we have two examples of, of park and telefonica right so um, Xerox is very well known for its copier machines and less for its um, computer uh, interfaces and hardware, despite having um, being you know one of the first to do this, and m one of the potential reasons is because the corporate didn't really see the value, the direct value of that new technology. And in a lot of companies, that um, what we see is this fear to cannibalize one's own existing market. So, I think that's really interesting, Pablo, that you're talking about Telefonica actually creating a separate entity where they can go wild and where you have actually taken the time and investment to create interdisciplinary teams that can then carry that out. So thank you. Franz, um, you have a very interesting model. And you actually told me that um, your launch pad, climate launch pad project was not intended to last more than a year, but is now one of the biggest clean tech projects. Yeah. Um, yeah, we sort of stumbled into success. Um, let me first go to Marcus. So, so I've worked in the US too. Um, I think what Europe does well, um, maybe not so much on the European level, but what countries do, for instance, is how Denmark built a policy framework for wind energy to develop, uh, for Germany to develop a policy framework for solar to develop. Like, basically, the German taxpayers paid for our cheap solar panels that we use today. Um, what is a well-kept secret is that actually this, this supercomputer that you have in your pocket was paid for by American taxpayers um, because it's filled with military technology. GPS, internet, uh, the, the photo, uh, uh, the camera on it. Um, so, so one of the things that people, when they talk about Silicon Valley, always go about, yeah, venture capital and startups, they do everything. If you go behind the scenes, like we both have, uh, it's very different. Um, so the funding agencies, what I, what I really like how Americans do it, is that RPE, Department of Energy, they can actually buy something. So instead of just funding research, basically your hobby, mm -hmm. they're saying to scientists, I have a hobby. Actually, no, I don't have a hobby, I have a problem. Can you build me something? So can you build for me a battery that works in space at minus sort of 200 degrees mm -hmm. for a year? Or sort of really practical problems. And then the spin-off of that is what happened with the smartphone. So, mm -hmm. so that military technology was never meant to, right. to get into our hands. Um, but in the US it happened, and part of that success story is truly about venture capital. Entrepreneurs getting that technology and then scaling it through venture capital. If, if you look at Europe, what we do well, I'd say that um, our innovation frameworks are pretty good. Uh, the in, sort of the creation of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology, EIT, was a good step. Mm -hmm. So we now have organizations like EIT Climate Kick, EIT Digital, EIT Health, so, so we're, we've sort of built this system for a societal problem and then getting academia, business, governments in a pool together to work on problems. Mm -hmm. Is it perfect? No. Um, but it's a beginning. And it, it's nice to have that beginning. So something like Climate Kick, Kick and Climate Launchpad could not have happened without that right. because it allowed us to put some money in a really small program for startups. Um, and, and then what happened with our program, it turned out there was a big need. Um, accelerators and incubators love to have sort of a, a program in a box uh, that they could use to select startups and train their startups. Right. You, you told me that you basically accidentally designed this startup support program to scale. Yeah, the reason is I'm lazy. I don't like management. Um, so we built it in a way that gave a lot of local autonomy, but gave me or us full control of the quality. And as it turns out, people are also lazy in designing these programs. So, so Climate Launchpad is a competition, but it's actually more like a business school program. But if you say to entrepreneurs, here's a business school program for you to learn, they won't show up because they don't like school. They want to work on their startup. Okay. So we designed it in a way that they work on their startup, 
but they're in school. And then at the end, we tell them, actually, this was not a competition. This was more like school. You just graduated. You shouldn't say that. There's a $10,000 prize. Start up first. You should apply for this. Yeah, we have to work a year for that. That is is not enough money. (laughs) Like, so the reason why we have such a small money prize is to make sure that the people who come for the money don't show up. So, So if you want to have real money with real prices, go to Hello Tomorrow. They have real money. This is where you should be. Great. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. So basically, um, what I would love uh, for the audience to carry away before I go to our panelists for their closing remarks on the change they'd like to see. Um, I think what we're talking about here is this huge opportunity to not make incremental change, as you were saying, Pablo, from you know, 2.0, 3.0, but to really think about um, what Um, disruptive change we can actually see in the future. And yes, this is the dirty little secret of Silicon Valley that actually the military and military funding helped to push that needle and um, say, you know, this crazy thing could happen. So we don't necessarily need to rely on governmental or military visions for that. We could also all work together and and, uh, go for this mission-driven idea and uh, basically call on each other to, to try and imagine and try to dream what the, next, uh, what the next thing could be. So with that, I'd like to turn, let's go in, in, in this order, um, friends, about the change that you'd like to see. What's imperative that um, we change in order to ensure that deep tech applications commercialize as they should. Um, well, what I would like to see is to have these deep tech sort of innovations focused on societal challenges. And the best way I know to get that done is to simply copy what we did for wind, solar, electric cars, same. Um, and there's a few problems still left if you look at it from a sustainability perspective. So first is CO2. CO2 in the atmosphere, we probably have to get some of it out if we don't want to get over two degrees. Um, we're probably going more for like three degrees. So what we still don't have is a good market for CO2. It can go two ways. You can either tax it, which would be the most efficient probably. The other option would be to say to large companies, well, look, you can now make plastics where you actually use CO2 as a feedstock. It's what nature does all the time. So we're going to force you into using CO2 as a feedstock in your your supply chain. So Apple or any other big company that uses plastic, well, by the year 2025, 1% of that plastic needs to come from CO2 taken out of the atmosphere. And we're going to grow that number to 20% in, let's say, 2030. Um, so for CO2, that would create a market. I, in, in the work I've done with Climate Kick, I've seen at least 20 super interesting startups that work on carbon capturing technologies and turning, sort of using CO2 as a feedstock. The problem is they, there's no market for them because they're way too expensive. And that's the problem we had with solar, that we had with wind, that we had with electric cars, and we solved it by creating a market for it. Mm. The other market I would like to see is, is about travel, especially about flying. Yeah. So all the planes that we have now that you sit in, then tomorrow if you go flying, will be there for the next 25 years at least. Right. Because these are really slow-moving uh, uh, goods. They have long life cycles. Right. So if you want to do something about the karma footprint of anything that needs a lot of energy, concentrated, like flying or industrial applications, we need biofuels. Um, And also there, the market incentives are not great. I've seen many super interesting companies that have beautiful technologies, but they just can't scale. There's no market, so there's no investment coming. So I would like to see like a few really big, fat, juicy problems and put a market incentive on it. And then what I've learned from Climate Launchpad, the entrepreneurs will show up everywhere. Right, right, absolutely. That's an excellent point. And I think we can count on this audience that uh, likes to look at the data to actually look at this problem that you're talking about and come to their own conclusion, right? So it's exactly that paradox that you said that we celebrate Elon Musk for Tesla, but actually the work that went into creating that market for electric vehicles and that allowed you to drive that electric Jaguar from the Netherlands to Paris to come here, actually relies on other actors, right? So, and, and by the way, it was Martin Eberhardt, the founder of Tesla, the name I forgot. So Martin Eberhardt, Mark Tapping, not, not Elon Musk. He's just very good in claiming credit. So on that question of creating markets and maybe the role of the government in helping, Martin, let me turn to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I loved your, 
remark on the CO2 markets because I totally agree with you. It's not working today, especially not in Europe. CO2 price has gone down because we, we failed in designing a good market to put this incentive on CO2 to give a, a good line of sight for investors because they could invest money in the long, in the long term because the CO2 uh, technologies are very long term technologies. Just wanted to come back on the things we are doing well also here and a little bit of publicity for France. Um, we have two, I think, mechanisms that are working very well, especially for innovation and, and deep tech innovation, which is the research credit tax. Um, so this is a mechanism where you can uh, remove a little bit of your uh, taxes, everything that we invest in research. That gives you a good environment for investing money here. And the second one is what we did uh, recently, which is the flat tax on the added value on new companies. And I think it's, it's showing the willingness, at least to have in France, to start with, and maybe in Europe later, um, a place for innovation to happen where you have governments which are uh, supporting you in those, in, in those innovations. Now, I think it needs to go further because there are lack of, of a lot of things. And coming from the US, I think the idea of having a DARPA or a European version of the DARPA, not necessarily associated to the military uh, industries, but uh, uh, yeah, so the, the ERT is probably one of them, but it's we have to think that's a little bit bolder and with much more money and on clear ways to access this money. That's my, my, my proposal here. And, and the second one, which is, again, I think very important on things we did well here, is that we kind of changed the way uh, politicians were, look, were looking like. Uh, we all had a generation of politicians that were all looking like the same, coming from the same schools, same experience. Myself, I'm an engineer and I'm trying to go in politics and I think this renewal of new faces will help also um, those worlds to match and to create the right uh, version of where we want to go. So these are the, the, the key things I think we need to, to have in mind. So my ask to you guys is to help me to uh, renovate the political world. I need to have an incubator in the uh, French National Assembly. I need to have an incubator in the European Parliament. I need to see tech every day uh, because otherwise policymakers won't even think about that. Right. You were in the hype of blockchain in the last five years. Now it's going to be the hype of blockchain in the politician speeches for the next five years. <laughs> so they are late by five years. Right. So if we want to bridge this gap, we really have to work right. together on that. And last thing that I need from you is to help me understand when one of your innovation is driving a lot of change in the society, we need you to tell us. Not to find the solution on how we solve the issue we are creating in the society, this new inequality we are creating, but just let us know and we'll find a way to fix it. But we need that in advance so we can adapt and prepare your innovation to be here, um, able to be used by the masses, and us here to protect um, the humans being behind that. Right. Thank you so much for those points, Martin. So in all seriousness, the next frontier for disruption is not robotics or um, clean energy. It's the government. It's the public sector, right? So how can we, as you say, friends, teach this elephant how to dance? Um, could I ask for the change you'd like to see or the good things that you'd like to see um, keep going? Um, Pablo and then Marcus. So um, from my side, I'd say three things. Um, Alpha is set up to go after moonshots, a billion size opportunities, impact the lives of hundreds of millions of people, deep tech, and where Telefonica has a right to play to provide social impact. So basically uh, doing well, by doing good. Um, on that journey, it requires a lot of uh, multidisciplinary. We have an ideation team with people from DARPA, from um, United Nations, ex-fighter uh, um, plane software designers that they try to come up with these moonshot proposals that then we incubate and we try to take to market like what we're doing with the health moonshot that is already showing results that are as good as face-to-face -face therapy with an AI um, software. Now, through this journey, something that uh, we learned uh, um, is the focus should be always first on the problem and not on the tech. And, um, and that is very relevant for this community. I am a trained scientist, technology at heart, but I've realized that if you keep putting the focus on the technology, you may end up with a hammer and no nail to hit. You're just going to have this big hammer and just going to be chasing what problem to solve. We're seeing it currently with blockchain. Nobody knows what problem really it is solving. It's up there 
uh, it still needs to be used by hundreds of millions of people and try to make a real difference in society as opposed to be a technology enabler. So uh, problem focus first. The second thing is, I think all these moonshots and these disruptions, a lot of it is going to be enabled by AI, AI fueled by your data. So uh, the second thing that I would say is uh, let's bring more ethics into AI. I think it's very important to uh, make sure that we do transparency, but we give data back to society, that they have the right to manage, control it. What's taking us here is not going to take us there, and not, not everything um, is going to be allowed going forward. So more interpretability, privacy preserving, and uh, emotional empathic AI. I think that is the whole area that if we crack it, and if we crack it from Europe, that's going to be a big differentiating factor. This is what's going to happen in China, Asia, or in the US. I think that's the second thing. And the third thing, it's a call for action in Europe. Um, I think there is great communities. Uh, there is a, a workshop later by the JDI organization trying to build the uh, DARPA for Europe. I, uh, I welcome you if you want to attend. Um, there is uh, a, lo a lot of uh, other communities that are caring about people and are caring about society. There are a lot of good universities producing very good value. And to me, this moonshot journey is one from belief to impact that we're not going to do alone. Um, we will need to put together um, great minds to uh, build uh, purposely driven organizations. And uh, if you want to join the journey, just uh, reach out. I'm more than happy to do so. Thanks so much, Pablo. Yes, so the stakes here are different um, in, this, in deep tech than, than other types of startups, right? So we've seen the winner-take-all phenomenon with Google and Facebook. But what your stakes that you're mentioning are the stakes for ethics and the algorithms that are going to actually determine um, um, health conditions or maybe in gene editing and uh, bioengineering. And those are stakes that we simply can't ignore. Marcus, what, are your, what is your perspective? So I'll, I'll uh, echo the, the think, panel-wide desire to create some kind of a DARPA equivalent here in, in uh, Europe. I think that's going to be very important to advance deep tech. And I'll, I'll say something that I think is, is, is quite, um, I guess, profound and very important for how that's designed. So one thing that you, the audience may not know is, is that uh, when you're hired in DARPA, they put the, your last day, the date of your last day on your badge. So there's you know, three year term limits and then you're out, right? And it's a, it, it, having that kind of sense of urgency uh, you know, instilled in people that could cycle through those types of agencies from day one and saying like, your job here is for three years to advance the science, then you're out, and then you have to go and do something else in academia and startups or in corporates. I think that is a really important cultural element to that allows that kind of innovation from those, that, those scientific breakthroughs to really, to really thrive. So I think that's an... That's an Let me add one point to that. Sure. So, the, so what that also does is it allows for people from academia like the, the top-notch people from academia to go into ARPA and do it for three years and then go back. Sure. So the way we set up our agencies, people work there for life. And it that is a bad sense. idea. Do not do that. So I'll, I'll just say that right now. Um, so, um, gosh, where was like I? You had a second point. I did, and now, of course, I'm completely, yeah, I'm completely blanking on that. But, well, there is a second point, actually. So I, I think a lot of people here on the panel, and I'm sure sort of the audience is thinking in a similar vein, has talked a lot about, like, how do you bring together the constituent parts of the ecosystem, government, academia, startups, corporates, investors, all of that, and solve problems together. I would also urge everybody to really think carefully about what you wish for in those types of constructs, right? Because a lot of how I think innovation really happens, and in, in many of these domains that we're talking about here, you know, next wave AI, climate change, you know, you're going to require a lot of bottoms up type of entrepreneurial activity. and. Sorry, Martin, but too much government involvement too early with too much regulation will stifle that and you won't see it, right? So it's, it's very important, I think, to get the preconditions right for, for to create that kind of, you know, uh, ecosystem to really thrive. And too much regulation can be a problem there. So I would just urge everybody to think carefully about how that's done. Thank you so much, Marcus. Those are great words of caution. So I think that gives us actually a great closing point because essentially what we have here is uncharted territory, right? There are policies left to be made. There are um, 
really urgent problems that need to be addressed. And we do have the tools and the talents and the energy and the passion. It's not, it really can't, it doesn't seem like 10, 15 a.m. when I look at this audience. They're clearly bursting with energy. Um, so, so I guess the next step is, as you all mentioned, to continue the conversation because you can never have the, um, this is one of the principles of open innovation that we were talking about yesterday, that the best, most talented, smartest person is likely not working for you, right? It's likely working in some other organization. So how can we enable ourselves to be open and en enable those connections to happen? So I would urge everyone in the audience to just enjoy the rest of Hello Tomorrow. We'll be talking about these problems at the workshop that Pablo mentioned, and also tomorrow at 3 p.m. we'll be talking about the role, um, how we can accelerate deep tech innovations for social impact. So the conversation's just started. Let's see what kind of interesting policies and innovations we get to work on. Thank you so much for your attention and let's thank these amazing panelists.